BDEW Kongress 2014 Podcast Energy Transition in Europe Perspectives of International Investors Helge Lund President and CEO Stad Oil ASA Starvanga Norwegen Dr. Johannes Theissen Vorsitzender des Vorstandes E.ON SE Düsseldorf Moderation Dr. Christoph Frey Secretary General World Energy Council London Großbritannien Dies ist ein internationales Investor Panel und damit Sie sich nicht mit meinem schweizerdeutschen Deutsch rumschlagen müssen, werden wir auch auf Englisch, auf etwas schweizerdeutsches Englisch und norwegisches Englisch ähm, über, äh, und deutsches Englisch natürlich ähm, übergehen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to again introduce this session on uh, the International Investors Panel on um, the international energy transformation, as um, uh, better known under the name Energiewende. It's not only an Energiewende here in, Ger here in Germany, it's one that is taking place also internationally, but with quite a different um, uh, face than in Germany. Uh, my organization, we are in uh, about 100 countries, and in th those countries measure year by year what keeps energy leaders most awake at night. And I'm obviously going to ask what keeps um, uh, the two personalities most awake at night as well. But um, first of all, give you a sense what we measure uh, uh, around the world as the keep me awake at night issues. First, we see that. Um, the global recession has really made, uh, created a lot of uncertainty across uh, the, the world um, with the implications on um, capital access, the, the whole question of um, uh, um, margins, etc. has been uh, obviously an, an important one. Second, we see that the price volatility um, energy prices, and don't think just only about oil, think about collapsing solar prices, think about CO2 price uncertainty, think about the shale uh, gas prices, etc. So price volatility is the second keep me awake at night issue. Third, the, specifically the CO2 framework, the CO2 price uncertainty is the number three uh, keep me awake uh, at night issue. I could add to that that um, the, the, the affordability issue in all the countries where we are active is creeping up the agenda. So the affordability issue is getting one that actually uh, increasingly uh, gets people worried. And last but not least, we see new risks, um, a new risk, physical risk on the cyber side, on the energy, water, food nexus side, um, on the extreme weather events side, but mostly on the political side. Those political risks are the biggest part of it that keep energy leaders awake at night. And the first question to both uh, our panelists um, are obviously how are you dealing in an international context full of uncertainties of that important magnitude? But I first um, uh, goes to Johannes Tyson. Well, I think um, I would mention, you know, three items uh, that are the most important in my eyes to, to keep me uh, awake. The one is, uh, will, will the world fundamentally stay on a claim, climate abatement uh, pathway? Because if that would be substituted by affordability or competitiveness for good, then a lot of the investments um, could be challenged that we did or continue to take. Um, the second one, I think, that is sometimes you know, understated also today on the Congress is, I think people always discuss a shift of power from, let's say, industry, utilities, towards politics. Um, I have some doubt that it will stay there. I think it will fundamentally go to the final consumer. I think so the role of the final consumer and his ability to shape the energy equation might be even more profound and more important uh, than the original political game that we are uh, embarking in. And the third one that um, an entrepreneur, an investor needs to always have in mind is um, can you invest, uh, can you attract investors uh, to, if necessary, afford you with, with fresh capital, believing that the risk reward balance is sufficiently attractive. And um, for the utility industry at large, I would say uh, this is not an easy one because investors got burned and they care less if it has been politics or bad management or bad luck. Uh, they just look on the outcome. And I think wherever they look, uh, let's say safe for the United States, they see um, quite a challenged environment for the utilities and therefore you need to have a convincing strategy, a good positioning to attract capital. So these three, the CO2 pathway, uh, the customer equation 
and the uh, attractiveness to, to investors and fresh capital are the three things that I think uh, are for me the most important. Well, thanks for, for that. I think we will certainly come back to the investors. I think we have recently run an investors roundtable and utilities, according to that, are no longer the darling of the financial industries. And I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, on your side, Helge Lund, um, you're running, uh, uh, some, some have uh, called the NOC, a uh, national oil company, but you have all the uh, NOC advantages by still being also an IOC uh, with the technology advantages. What keeps you uh, awake at night uh, in this uh, context of change internationally? Well, for, first of all, in all this uncertainty and, and, and stability and unpredictability, you need something that is stable. And I, I wanted to thank you for being invited to this uh, conference. And I think what is stable is actually the relationship between Norway and, and, and Germany. I mean, it's a deep political partnership. It's, uh, it's very strong on energy and I think in, increasingly also on the industrial side. And just to give you an idea, we are procuring for roughly $30 billion dollars per year to our operations and uh, German companies, industrial companies, are really important partners to make us uh, uh, com 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 competitive in an increasingly competitive industry. You, you know, I would like to focus on three big uh, challenges uh, in relative to your, your question, and all of them is actually starting with a C. The first one is cost efficiency. And we have seen in the last 10 years uh, a tripling of the oil price while the return in uh, the oil and gas industry has actually been reduced by 30% of the same period. So the cost is going up, the capital intensity is going up, and the risks is dramatically going up while the return is going down. So the industry has really to change the underlying productivity and improve it in order to stay competitive for, for capital and for talent. The, the second is actually climate efficiency, where I think big industrial corporations and industry, they need to be seen as addressing the pressing issue of any society. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing on the earth right now is actually to reconcile uh, two dilemmas. How do we procure and develop more energy and at the same time reduce CO2 emissions? And we have to be seen as part of the solution, not only to providing the, the, the issue. The, the third um, C is really about the communities. And my part of the industry is actually coming closer and closer to sensitive, very sensitive areas. And we are also doing our operations much closer to where people actually live. And I give you one statistics. It is said that 15 million Americans now live within a mile from an oil and gas uh, drilling or a well. And that, I think, means that we as an industry has to be much more effective in being open and having a dialogue with the society to make sure that our activities uh, is trusted I think also it indicates that we need to engage in a much more open way with regulators and politicians so they understand the capabilities uh, uh, of this, uh, these industries. All of these three Cs I think we need to, uh, to respond to and from time to time it can keep me awake at, at night. Excellent. I think I hear also again cost efficiency is uh, coming back to the investors in the end, end because returns are going down. Uh, climate, we have an agreement on the climate side as well that this is important. You add the, the communities and the trust issue. Let me stay for a moment with gas. And obviously, gas, if you talk about the global energy event the first uh, for a moment, I think gas has been uh, the, the placeholder almost. Uh, the shale gas revolution has been the placeholder for the global energy, uh, energy event. The question uh, we have seen last year. Uh, to bring it back to facts perhaps, and we have seen 45,000 wells being drilled last year worldwide. Only 3,900 of them have been drilled outside North America. Is the shale revolution still a US phenomenon? And you know, how has it affected your business? What are you doing things differently? What has it changed on your side? So we are a big player in uh, shale in, in the US and we have taken the positions of the last six to seven uh, years. My perspective on this is that in North America we have probably identified the most uh, efficient uh, place 
for, for shale resources. Uh, so I think the fields that we will develop in the, in the future will probably have higher sort of break-even points than what you see today. On the other hand, and working against uh, a higher cost is really the, the industry's ability to, to all the time drive, drive down the efficiency and uh, improve the efficiency and innovate so that we get more resources uh, out, of the, uh, out, out of the field. So I believe that in North America, you know, uh, shale will have a, and shale gas will have a, a lasting uh, impact on energy supply. I think all the re pre-requirements for effective shale operations are in place in the US. They have very efficient rocks. They have uh, financial incentives for owners of land to participate. Uh, they have a very efficient uh, uh, industry. And I think a political framework that is conducive and supporting for oil and gas activities. And then I think also the US is much more or much less densely populated uh, than, than Europe. No doubt there are shale resources outside um, uh, North America as well, but I think all of these factors need to be in place really to, 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 to have shale make a, make a real impact. We have a position in Australia, we have a position in, uh, in, in, in Russia uh, as well, and uh, then we have to see what is the impact of shale in Europe more directly. Our thinking right now is that it will not make a significant impact on the medium term. And I think it has, to a, lar to a large extent, has to do with uh, sort of the public acceptance uh, of uh, shale activities in Europe. And as long as we are not testing and drilling, it's very hard to uh, understand the potential. I'm immediately coming to the gas renewables point, um, uh, but before that, one more one more question. Perhaps you're you're investing massively, obviously, uh, as um, uh, as that soil into um, into the upstream still, uh, be it in the um, be, be in the Arctic, be in the, um, the, the, your own shelf, or be be it in the Caspian, etc. And we see at the same time, obviously, the, the the contract structures change as well. You know, what does it take for you to continue investing? Do you still get the right investment signals? From the um, from the delinkage of oil versus or gas uh, from oil delinkage side, etc. Are you are you still getting the right signals to to continue your investments? So first of all, start to support support the liberalisation of markets that will bring forward the most efficient solution. We have modernised all our contracts uh, uh, so that we have a, we have gas to gas uh, uh, sort of linkages, uh, and we find appropriate structures with the different uh, uh, different customers. I must say, however, that uh, the policy sing signals for the role of gas in the energy mix in Europe uh, for the long term is very unclear for the moment, in including in, uh, in, in Germany. And we need, I think, stronger policy signals and, and as strong as signals about the direction of the energy policy moving forward, forward in order to undertake the the billions and billions and billions of dollars in investments that we have to undertake to, to be a, a long-term partner to, for, 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 for Europe and for Germany in, in, in gas. So policy signal could, for gas, very unclear. What does it mean for you? Could I, could I add, you know, I'm not claiming I'm the biggest expert here, and I take these numbers from a recent publication of the International Energy Agency. But what impressed me there was um, the number they say, you know, to transport one calorie of energy in gas costs 10 times what it costs to transport the same energy calorie in oil. 10 times. And that's also, you know, if you now would buy, a, uh, in America you would pay four to five dollars per million BTU, but you would pay likely six dollars to bring it into Europe. So it costs more to transport than the energy costs. And that is obviously um, a very sp unique feature. It's not true for oil, it's not true for coal. So, for me, the question is, will we also see a revolution in transport costs? And if we do not see that, then we might have just regional gas markets with quite different um, differentials long time. And that could impact uh, the role of gas in, in several markets. But I'm, I'm not an expert, and I wonder, you know, are we too immature in the development? Could that also decline quite significantly? I think the, the total gas price that we see a significant decline of the low American wet gas levels, I doubt somewhat. 
I would at least not bank on that, so I think that part is important. But uh, I think Helge is also right. One part is first, you know, the ability to find gas in a commercial manner. I think there I would be convinced enough that gas can play a long-term role. In the Energy Congress, you, your organization housed in Rome, it was still, you know, is it 30 or 40 years? In Montreal, the question was, is it 200 or 300 years? And I think people have now started calculating years because um, likely uh, there will be always uh, enough gas around. So availability, also commercial availability, I have no doubts. Transport, I'm uncertain. Uh, pipeline versus LNG and costs. Um, and the third one, obviously, is what role is it supposed to play in markets? That could be driven by just pure commercials, could be driven by a climate strategy, it could be driven by political preference. And there, uh, I, I share what, what Helga says. If you look on the Energiewende paper drafted by the Merkel government before Fukushima, I think you didn't find the word gas. If you looked after Fukushima, you still didn't find the word gas. And even today, um, it is just uh, cautiously mentioned from time to time, but more as a problem in, in, in reference to Ukraine and other issues than as an opportunity. And I think the industry, believing in the climate abatement strategy, has heavily invested in the, the upstreamers on, on, on new gas sources, on new pipelines. Uh, we, as downstreamers, we have invested in CCGTs and, and, and new storages. And I think we all are a bit now surprised that the climate opportunities are not truly fully discussed. I think obviously it's partly true to, you know, we have allowed the full deterioration of the ETS. So climate abatement that has no price, thus no value and thus no incentive. Um, but I think there are also other tendencies that, uh, that, that brought gas to a very unstable situation on the demand side. And I think there are some answers necessary. Um, and and I'm, I'm still puzzled that in some discussions, Mr. Oettinger and others, uh, and you will meet him tonight, discuss at length if we have a fourth, a fifth or a sixth corridor. While I miss the debate, uh, you know, if we have all those corridors and all those guests, what, what precisely do we do with it? So first point, obviously the gas transportation cost, if you look at oil transportation cost, it's probably 1% of the overall market price of oil, uh, $1 out of $100 going to the transportation order of magnitude, but for gas, it's, uh, if it's a 6 uh, or a 4 to, a four to 6 uh, per MBTU, then it's the same $6 to ship the, the gas around to all the clients. Clearly, that makes a big difference, and you're asking, well, what is the um, cost-saving potential in the $6 um, per MBTU that, uh, that it takes to ship uh, gas, uh, uh, gasify and uh, uh, etc. Um, that is the first question. The second one, clearly, um, gas is a stepchild in the energy when the discussion it has not been um, uh, dealt with. Um, uh, at the same time, we have heard so many. Uh, times gas is the natural complement of renewables. Well, well, what, ha what happened to that? What happened? What went wrong? What needs to get right on, on that side? Perhaps Johannes Tyson first. I guess you know that that has been lip service, and obviously I would say uh, it doesn't also help us to have more of the same lip service. There is no natural alien of someone or a friend of someone, friend or foe. If you do, if either it's driven by economics or it's driven by political management or, or regulatory management. Otherwise, the advantages easily disappear. Right now, some people claim we would need a doubling of the coal price or a halfening of the gas price or a tenfold rise of the CO2 price to get on, on an average efficient gas and coal plant to get the shift from coal to gas. That's long ways, I would say. Uh, I still believe, for me, a clear signal that Europe wants to continue with a single target towards climate abatement for 2030. That is almost, for me, the test question, almost a religious question. If they don't come to terms there, I think the credibility of the whole strategy is at risk. And then investors will, will be extremely cautious to embark uh, on any capital investments along the line. So we need that signal. But secondly, I think we need other signals and other decisions to complement that over time. And we need an a political and a communicational support that gas can be a very clean part of an equation and not, you know, some discussions, if you discuss it in context of renewables, it's dirty, and you discuss it the next morning in context of coal, it's suddenly clean. So what precisely is it now? Maybe it's a... You need a bit of different uh, debate on that. So it's the, it's the vision forward. It's the, and, and I'm coming back to the clear signal on CO2 asking as well for, 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 for your position on that. But uh, before, I, I think 
is the vision out there that we can deliver 100% um, renewables in terms of energy, but we still need to uh, almost 100% capacity capability um, uh, as backup? And, uh, and what happens then to high energy efficiency plants on gas? Do we need them still, or are those very cheap kind of plants that can be used to do the backup? What, what happens to Ersching, your, your high efficiency plant in that vision? I think that's a lengthy debate and I would shy away from that because you would need to understand some regulation around that uh, that squeezes it more than, than the efficiency. Uh, so I think uh, some makeup uh, is, 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 is in, in work there. But um, isn't it, you know, the question you asked, for me it's a question on, on storage finally. You can only cover an energy system on clean energy if you can commercially store. If you cannot, then you will also, you will, then you will not just need capacity backup, you will also need an energy backup. I have not yet seen the full, true and clear answer on, on, on commercial storage, therefore I think we believe we need a, a more conventional backup based on gas and likely on some coal uh, for decades to come. Um, and obviously the other breakthrough would change the industry for good, uh, but I haven't seen that. Um, but you know, I think if it were only backup, if 100% renewable energy would be doable, then the answer, admittedly, would be open cycle and not high efficient gas for a few hours. Uh, why avoid uh, you know, much CO2? You would just run an open cycle on that. But that would also mean that you have no gas in the system, rather hardly any gas. Um, I do not yet believe in that because I don't see the storage answer. And therefore, I think high efficient gas should be protected and should be kept in the system, but right now it needs some, some backing. One of those backings that we need is uh, fair and, 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 and marketable uh, capacity markets, as has been discussed in the morning. Another one is the ETS signal, and the third one uh, we need to debate on the customer side. So that would obviously be a nightmare mission for, for a gas supplier if, if he came to that, that world. Um, the, the currently the demand is um, going down on the, on the heat side, the demand is going down on the electricity side, transport hasn't really taken off, um, CO2 price to, to en encourage, uh, encourage a broader, rather gas than coal use isn't there either, so what, what is the way forward? So I, I think my perspective, if I take a step back, would be a strong support to the original goals of all the, the energy policies in, in Europe and in Germany. That was to increase security of supply, increase competitiveness and reduce CO2 emissions. I think all of us have, have to admit that we are today in a different place. It's much messier than we thought about four or five years back. We have overlapping, very complicated uh, policies. We have a quite inter interventionistic uh, approach by regulators around, and we have ended up in a place with more CO2 emissions, less security uh, of, uh, supply, and a not competitive energy system. So something has to, to change. The recipe that we are looking at would, be, will, would consist of three elements. The first one is actually to refocusing again on reducing emissions instead of having a, a, a fixed goal on the renewable share. The second is actually to use much less coal, because we know that 90% of the emissions from the electricity sector is, is, is really from, uh, from coal. And it's, it's, for me, it's really hard, and for us, it's hard to, to conceive that you will meet your energy and climate goals unless you have much more gas also in the electricity uh, sector. And the final point is, is actually about, to a much larger extent, use market-based mechanisms to make sure that you produce the most stable and efficient solutions in dealing with the two issues, energy security as well as uh, uh, cost competitiveness on, on top of the, 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 the re reduced emission. To me, that, that means a much stronger effort by European politicians, including Germans, to actually reform, have a deep and broad reform of the ETS uh, uh, system. I think the end vision is, uh, I think most people will, will, will agree that an end vision of renewables and gas is more competitive, it's more flexible, and it's, it's um, uh, uh, less costly than 
the current partnership, very expensive partnership between renewables and coal? Well, you're saying it very clearly yeah, that we, we promote the trilemma to our Energy Council and the, and the trilemma is about energy security, it's about environment, it's about uh, the social equity side and you saw, you're saying basically five years ago we, we, we were um, optimistic about those and we find five years uh, later that in all of those three dimensions we have actually gone, gone down downstream, um, whatever you want to call that. I think, um, let me come back to the investor's perspective. You have mentioned that the return on investment is going down. Does this shy away your investors? Does it make it more difficult for you to finance a future project, be it in the upstream or perhaps also on the LNG or pipeline side? Well, it's, inter it's interesting to see that uh, if I look at the peer group of Statoil in the last year, you know, Roughly half of my peer group had a return on capital employed on less than 10%. And a couple of them were around six, seven. And I think most people will understand that you're not investing in a company that has to take reservoir risks, technology risks, market risks, political risks, geopolitical uh, risks at the return of six to seven percent. Then you rather put uh, the money in, your, in, in the bank even at the low, uh, low interest rate. So this, this has really, this has to change. It cannot last. And I don't think that the answer is for the industry to stop investing. I think the answer is actually to work much more on productivity improvements, standardization, replication more than we did in the past. And I think other industries than the oil and gas industries has been much better in working efficiency and productivity than, than, uh, than we have. So this is a challenge. Uh, and it was actually the first C in my initial remarks that, that we have to address. Then I think we will be competitive in terms of competing for capital, but I think even more importantly for people and talent, talents moving forward. Perhaps also on the utility side, I mean, we have seen, you know, it's, it's not, uh, we have speak, uh, spoken to many strategies and I think many have uh, used the wording uh, along the lines, it's not very difficult to come up with a scenario for utility where the future is very dark. Um, it, it's, um, and if you draw the, the, the way forward um, um, with this pure 100% renewable, small de decentralized, this fundamentally changes the business model. This fundamentally changes the business model of, of a utility and again, what it creates investors and, se and security as well. How, you know, how do you see investors react to that? How, how easy is it for you to find capital um, uh, to, to address those issues? I think first of all, and it's going the same line as Helge, you find an investor for everything. It's just a question of costs. And um, high risk uh, means uh, high reward or low price. Um, that's very simple. Um, and the question will be for the utility industry, I think uh, we might see the day where the traditional, very broad-based utilities have to reposition themselves because costs of capital in some of our business are quite different from others. And there the issue and the challenge will be how broad can you be, how specified do you need all, needs also your value proposition to be for, for the various investors' communities. And, um, and also I share what Helga says in the end. Um, in politics and in business, it might be all about efficiency. Um, if you can beat your competitors and convince your investors on high efficiency implementation of your strategy, I think, irrespective of, of the level of risk you're housing, you find investors. It might be hedge funds for some of the business. And I don't know if, if politics would be tremendously happy if they find out that a, a backbone of their system is only in the hand of hedge funds at the end of the day. But it could be the outcome. And, and, and it would be... Uh, it, it is in the cards, but it doesn't mean that there are no investors. And thus, I think it's, 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 it, a lot of the difference will be on, on strategy, on implementation, and on efficiency. And I think that has been highly neglected on business, and we need to be self-critical on that, but also on political side. If you see on, on the energy vendor and how it has been implemented, irrespective of the outcome, I think there have been such a level of inefficiency in that. If Germany was a corporation, and had housed, for example, the way it unfolded the PV game. I think it might be subject uh, to a small impairment charge. Um, and then it would continue, as, 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 as Mr. Betzüge says, you know, it's just a third or the fourth owner after some impairments uh, might be a happy camper on that. 
uh, but I don't think we can continue to transform our society in inefficient manners. It is tough enough to compete against uh, cheap conventionals in America and Asia. If you then do it on top of that, inefficiently, I think then you're doomed to be lost. And, and therefore, I think um, the reforms debated today in, in Berlin are a first step in the right direction of adding some efficiency. But it doesn't feel like a high efficient gas plant, truly. So it's more a reformation than a true reform for now. Um, and, and hedge funds might be maybe the future investors in, in utilities. What are you telling your pension fund, your own pension fund? Would you uh, traditional investors in, in, investors in utilities have included, and, and also on the oil and gas side, ha, have included large pension funds? Are you? I haven't. I, I haven't argued that today. It's just hedge funds. I just say you know, dependent on where, where regulation goes, the value proposition that was proposed by some people on stage in the morning how you should run with full risk uh, the capacity. You can't do that. And supposedly, in, in some remote hours, you will see extreme prices of 10, 20,000 euro. Uh, it should work and deliver the same result. It's theoretically, the market will deliver the same result. But do you truly believe a pension fund would grant you the money on the belief that politicians will stay, stay silent on these 20,000 hours? and not just suddenly find out it doesn't cost 20,000 euro to produce that hour, and suddenly say, you know, oh no, uh, not so good, uh, you invested your money, but now you get the returns. So I think theoretically markets can deliver all perfect results. In practical terms in this industry, I think if, re if risk is too extreme and reward, the necessary reward is too extreme, it just won't happen, and then you need a different form of regulation and, and that regulation, therefore, I think is not a theoretical need, it's a practical must. And um, I think, you know, I listened to, to some other people on stage, but I would also share with you what Mr. Fatih Birol, the, the, the General Secretary of, uh, or the Chief Economist of the International Energy Agency said, uh, in Europe, uh, the first time in his life, the lights could go out. And this is not a guy employed by our industry. Uh, this is a guy employed by governments in the end and saying, you know, we might need 100 gigawatt of, of new capacity backup, and he doesn't see a single build. And I don't see a single build, and I don't see if I would go to Wall Street or to London uh, tomorrow, or to Oslo and say, could you grant me 4 billion, I want to build a new fleet of CCGTs. I don't think I make it alive to the street. Again, pension fund, be prudent, is probably the, is, 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 is one of the implied statements. It, can, it cannot be that we destroy pension fund money in a way with regulation that, go, that is not carefully thought through. How about you, on your side, do you see the investor profile changing as well? Pension fund have been traditionally in, in your sector as well. Is that changing? Actually, I, I think the financial market, to a large extent, understand that uh, part of the public the debate around the climate and, uh, and uh, uh, energy are underestimating how easy it is to transform a society away from uh, hydrocarbons. So I think that uh, it's interesting to note that even in the UN IPCC panels projections around the 2% or, or 2 degrees scenario, there is as much oil in the equation at it, at, as it is today and much more gas. And people tend to forget that uh, when, you, when you have opened an oil and gas field, you have a natural decline. So you need to undertake significant, massive investments only to keep the production at the, at the current level. And, and as long as the industry is effective in dealing with the productiv productivity challenge, I, I think there is a, a good uh, uh, you know, return to be ha had in our industry as well. Then we see that investors are increasingly concerned about climate and they would like to see, as Johannes is, is alluding to, an efficient system being dealt with and they would like companies to take an active approach uh, in, in terms of dealing with this, uh, uh, in, in, in this challenge. And, and that, uh, I think, has two dimensions. One is about how do you uh, develop a company that is resilient against increasing CO2 prices, that has to happen if you want a clean, clean and competitive uh, you know, energy system in the, in the future. And the second is that, uh, that your operations are actually robust towards, um, for instance, extreme weather in the short and medium term.
Climate is a key word. We have only a few minutes left, but I think I'd like to get a, a few short uh, recommendations out of that. What would you want from, on the, on the one hand, we have COP21 um, uh, next year in Paris, and the, the hopes for COP21 are probably almost in a similar kind of place as they were pre-COP um, uh, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, COP15. And the question, what, what, can you see, what do you see from your perspective happening to that process and what would be the, the hoped outcome? And the other, similarly to the, um, if you look at the, uh, the German energy event, uh, what would you hope from be the ETS, actually that's Europe as well, but then also from the, uh, the German market design? Perhaps Johannes Tyson first and then Helge Lund. Um, first, um, climate, COP21, then ETS and then German market. What would COP21, be I would not overestimate and not overexpect on, otherwise the frustration will be too high. I think in the end we'll see some fundamental recognition and much more not to be expected. Uh, and I think it will be on regional systems, uh, like the US now does on just pure regulation instead of politics. Uh, and Europe needs to continue on some pathway by itself. I think China, by maybe some very different reason, uh, will also embark on a journey there. So I think regional systems and a shared general conviction that something needs to be done is more important. And Europe needs to put its 2030 targets now up. And that should be a single ETS target, a swift reform around it, and a very immediate implementation, not waiting for 2020, while wasting five years on the pathway instead of starting tomorrow morning. So no backloading? Uh, I would do uh, the, the strate strategic reserve immediately. Uh, I would do the backloading and I would consider even, even, even tougher measures uh, to implement a faster pathway on that. It, would, it might have some impact on wholesale prices. I think it, it should not be overestimated, but it will immediately also lower the burden on subsidies on the renewables. And thus for the total system costs, it might not be more costly, it just might be more efficient. So ETS reform is the fundamental first thing. The second thing is phase out subsidies on conventional fossil and unconventional, including renewable subsidies, as soon and as swiftly as possible. And bring all energies into the market and make every investor subject to market risk. Because the present system where people have no accountability and no responsibility is a dead thing. It will not deliver anything but costs. And thus the integration into the market and the sound and swift sourcing out of, of, the, of the subsidies is, is vital. The third thing is we need to find an answer for the question of capacity and energy, clean energy on the one thing and safe capacity on the other side. A, a clean market will be oversupplied at many hours and the system will not deliver otherwise if you don't have a capacity price. So we need that as a third answer. And the fourth one would be have a European answer or a regional answer. I'm saying European answer obviously includes uh, a neighbor, a good neighbor like Norway, even if not being part of the community itself. But I think you know it's in front of our house door and therefore we should implement a European strategy and some European instruments with our national friends here, or, or, or regional friends, and make sure that we can deliver on the overall strategy as much market-based, investor-friendly as possible, but uh, governed by the political system of climate abatement. I think those three actions might hopefully deliver. In the end, if we then win, is beyond politics and beyond business, because it might depend on are the answers of America and Asia just better than ours? Uh, yeah, then we have a problem. Um, but. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't compete. It just means uh, we will not be ourselves the jury to declare ourselves uh, the victors. It will be the world seeing who has won and who has lost. And it's all in the cards. We could win still and we might lose badly. So clear, clear point, the market risk must be shared among everybody, uh, all the players and regional answers are, are key as well. Um, on your side again, very briefly on COP21, what are expected outcomes or should, uh, should be outcomes, ETS and also perhaps the uh, renewable uh, law here in Germany, any, any well, perspective? On, on, on COP I agree with Johannes' uh, perspectives, uh, but I think one can in an optimistic moment uh, have more hope in the sense that maybe they could be uh, some momentum uh, created between the US, China and, and, and Europe in, in really moving that process uh, going. On, on, the, on, on the European energy policy, I would say strongly market-based uh, solutions to bring forward the most efficient uh, 
solution, and that means a deep and broad reform of the uh, ETS and get rid of all kind of other targets in terms of renewable shares and so on and so forth, because that brings uh, along the, 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 the best solutions. I will not comment specifically on the situation in Germany, but I will sell Norway for a moment. I think we are too humble, too friendly, and too integrated in Europe, so you take us for granted. <laughs> but actually, I think uh, we have a big opportunity and you have a big opportunity to build on what we have created together for the last 30 years on energy. I think we can provide um, gas at very competitive uh, terms and we can, we can provide security of supply. And I have this uh, feeling that in Germany you think that Norway is done by 2020 in terms of energy supply. The fact is that at the current uh, level of German gas production, we can serve Germany for 50 years with the resources that we have already discovered. So in that sense, I think there is a big opportunity for Norway and for Germany to, to, to come closer uh, on the energy and, and dealing with many of the issues that you're struggling in uh, with in the energy discussion here in, in Germany right now too humble and too friendly and otherwise to think as well this, there may be a Chinese customers on the other hand. One very brief last, uh, last question, it's a very important one and I'm not going to ask about the energy price because that would be too difficult but about the World Cup, who is going to win? Jonas Tyson. <laughs> Well, I see, I see Jeffrey there, so I, I would hope America wins experience tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> and Germany wins the championship. <laughs> I, I can only rephrase what this uh, British football player Gary Lineker said at one time, that football is a game of 22 people chasing a ball for 90 minutes and in the end Germany wins. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Weitere Informationen und Podcasts unter bdew.de/kongress.